can start by talking about the unique importance of the kind of fight that we've been having on the, with the Save the Internet campaign, not just to the internet, but to the future of public media generally. Well, it's, it's foundational. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> so why, why is this fight for digital media especially important right now? Well, it's especially important right now because the decision made right now, this is, this is what we call in, in history and sociology a critical juncture. The decision we make right now is going to put us on a path for generations. It's going to be very hard to get off. Once you go down that path and institutions and structures and patterns and laws and regulations are built around certain assumptions, it's very difficult to get off that path down the road and say, gee, that was a dumb idea. You're stuck there. And we're at this historic moment where we can make the decision which path we go down. They only occur in media once or twice a century. Broadcasting came along, we got to make that sort of decision. The telegraph comes along, you make that sort of decision. What sort of system are we going to have, public or private? What are the terms? Who's going to run this thing? What values get privileges, privileged? What values get shunted aside? And that's what this is all about, ultimately, with net neutrality. Uh, this fight, uh, Save the Internet, is all about what the next 100 years, the next 50 years of the entirety of our communication system will be. Because the one thing we know for sure is the Internet's going to be the foundation. Digital communication is going to be the foundation of the entirety of communication in the very near future. It's rapidly assuming that role now. And if we have net neutrality, it's going to create a world that's very different than if we don't have it. If we have net neutrality, it means the founding principle of the Internet, which is all websites are created equal. All users have equal right equal to the public at the same price at the same speed. Uh, if we have it, then it's going to ensure at least the foundation for a democratic, free, and egalitarian communication system. If we don't have it, it's through. It's over. All bets are off. Because if we don't have it, the internet will be privatized. If we don't have it, the companies that only exist because they were granted government monopoly licenses, the huge phone companies, the huge cable companies, companies that never won anything in the free market, they won their power because they own the politicians. If we don't have internet neutrality, they're going to use their muscle with the politicians to guarantee that they can privatize the internet, this wonderful public creation that had nothing to do with building, and dictate which websites we get to see and which websites we don't, which websites come through instantly, the ones that pay them off, the ones they own, the ones they're friendly with, and which websites take a minute and a half to download, they're on the dirt path, the ones that no sane person is going to want to wait around to go to when the other ones shoot through so quickly. That's what's at stake here. And believe me, it's an enormous fight. And if we go down this path and we let the largest industries in this country nationalize and privatize, take over the Internet, we're not going to get off that path. They're going to be too powerful. No matter how awful it is, they're going to control the thing. This is the moment in history we can take it down the correct path, stay down that path, keep the Internet as it's been. The genius of the Internet was never technology. That was always a myth. The genius of the Internet was a policy which required the Internet to be open. That's not a technology. The technology can close it down. The technology can make it privatized. They've got the technology ready. They're eager to put it in place. We've got to put the policy in place that makes that impossible. So as part of what you're saying, that, let's say, for example, that even if you're not an Internet user, even if you're just a TV watcher, you know, that part of what you're saying is that you should still care about these kinds of digital policies because in the, in the near future, that's going to be the backbone of, of everything we use to communicate, in, including television. That's right. And what you're going to be able to see on television will be determined by this policy completely. The ideas you hear, the music you hear, the movies you watch, the reality shows you watch, everything will be shaped by this fundamentally. Because what's going to happen is, if we go down that route, if we go down the road of letting the phone monopolies and the cable monopolies privatize the internet, become the sort of the censors of which websites are allowed through and which aren't, over a system they had nothing to do about building. I mean, if we go down that absurd route, uh, what will happen is that if someone has a great idea for a good TV show or for a good movie or great music, uh, it's going to have to get their approval before you get a chance to see it. Right now, it doesn't need their approval. All they've got to do is get on the web. They've got the same right to get on the web for to be seen as anyone else. And then it's up to you. That's what's at stake here. And as, as the internet takes over television, and it's rapidly taking over music, the music industry, it's rapidly taking over radio broadcasting. As it takes over television, which is inevitable, that's, who's going to be, that's the issue at stake here. And it'll affect everyone, no matter how you know, deeply embedded into your couch with a bag of chips under one arm, and a beer in the hand, this will affect you. Um, let's talk about tactics, 
uh, going forward in 2007. There's been a lot of talk this weekend about we're no longer uh, on defense, we're going on offense. Let's talk in specific terms, like what are the three major victories in your mind that we need to win and focus on in 2007? Well, clearly the starting point is we have to win net neutrality. Uh, we've got to get that in law. We've got to get signed, passed by Congress, both the House and Senate. Uh, and then we've got to force President Bush to sign it. And if President Bush refuses to sign it, if President Bush vetoes it, we've got to put so much pressure on him that he will change his mind. And if he doesn't change his mind, we've got to put so much pressure on the members of Congress, they will override that veto for fear of losing their job. I think that's our job at hand. And if we can't do that in the 2008 elections, anyone who did not vote for net neutrality we will actively work against to make sure they're unemployed come January 2009. And finally, this movement has the leverage to back that up. We've never had it before. In our experiences, that gets politicians' attention. So going into it, we've got our work cut out for us. We're winning against the wealthiest lobby in the country, the lobby that, according to Ed Markey, who is the chair of the Committee of the House, has a single, each firm has a single lobbyist for every member of Congress. So you know, if you're a member of Congress, you've got a team of lobbyists representing these companies just working on you alone. Well, that's what we're up against us, this scraggy little mosquito going to go up against this dinosaur. Uh, that's the fight we're in. But we've got the people of the country behind us. When they look out the window, they're not going to see anyone on their side. All they're going to see is a handful of rich guys and lobbyists and no one else. We've got the people of this country. So if we get the people of the country engaged, we'll win. Organized money can defeat, uh, or organized people, oh my God. Uh, organized people can defeat organized money. So that's the big fight, and it's going to be a tough fight for us, but that's the central one in front of us. In terms of media ownership, going on offense means this. Prior to the November election in 2006, we thought uh, in the Republican-controlled Congress, uh, we faced a situation where the Federal Communications Commission might relax ownership rules, in particular the really important rule called banning cross-ownership. The rule that prevented one company in a town from owning the daily newspaper monopoly, three TV stations, eight radio stations, the cable system, the ISP, the works, basically having company town media in city after city. This is what the, the dream of the media conglomerates, because you have no competition, you control the advertisers, you have no one competing with your newsroom, so you don't have to cover any journalism, you can get away with it. Uh, that's the big media ownership rule that's at stake. Uh, before the Democrats won in 2006, we thought we were going to have to have a massive campaign in Congress to overturn that and eventually win in the courts, like we did in 2003. Now I don't think that Congress will let the FCC go ahead and do that. And I think the FCC's head, Kevin Martin, is mapping his strategy. He's not a dumb man at all. He's very clever. He's very smart. He's very much committed to doing what will ever make big media corporations richer. That's his mandate. If you understand that, you understand everything he's ever done in his career. Uh, and he's a very worthy adversary for us, and we're paying very careful attention to him. By playing offense, what I think we want to do is all the evidence that has been collected, that I've seen, all the research, suggests that we should strongly <clears throat> reduce the amount of media we allow single firms to own. There's no justification to allow one company to own 1,200 radio stations. It makes no sense at all, like Clear Channel currently does. There's no economic justification for it. The cost of doing radio broadcasting is plummeted with digital technologies. There's no justification for having a company own more than a few radio stations. Uh, and they say, well, we can't make enough money? Fine, sell them. Well, we can't find any other conglomerates that want to buy them? Fine, sell them to some people in the local community. Let them take a crack at it. I bet they'd find people in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, willing to own the Milwaukee radio stations. Maybe they're not willing to pay $300 million for it, but they'll pay what it's actually worth in the market. And if the big conglomerate says, well, that's not fair, say, no, of course it's fair. This is a government license that you got. You have no right to it. It's not your property. It's been a privilege. And you should just get out of the industry if you're not willing to serve the public. Um, Tom Fenton, uh, former senior correspondent for CBS News, uh, said, uh, Americans awaken, awaken to the dangers of junk food. It's time we awaken to the dangers of junk news. Do you think that junk media is making our democracy kind of fat and lazy in the same way that, that junk food is, is uh, polluting our bodies? I wouldn't necessarily use that uh, a metaphor, but I think it's true, and I don't think there's much doubt about it. I mean, it's, it's not... In some sense, it might just be that stories about Britney Spears' underpants or Brad Pitt's love life are, are inane and they waste time in our brain cells. And that's part of the story. But really, a lot of it just is that what's not covered at all. 
I mean, just that there's no coverage of so many crucial stories that affect us and affect our lives. Or the coverage we get is so warped and distorted, basically to funnel to us what the government wants us to know or what powerful interests want us to know. And don't give us the sort of criticism, the range of debate that draws us into public life where we actually make the decisions ourselves with real information rather than being spoon-fed information so we'll simply ratify what people in power uh, want to do. And I, so I think the real fundamental question beyond Fenton's formulation is what's going on in journalism, which his book has done a brilliant job of exposing, which is the commercial model of journalism in the United States now is in free fall. It's disintegrating. It is no longer profitable for the big media companies to do journalism. What they've turned to, uh, mistakenly in my view, is doing the fat, fatty, fat food, junk food journalism of celebrities, of spoon feeding press releases from powerful people. And the problem with that is that that stuff's so worthless that they're losing readers and users. Why? Who's going to waste their time looking at that? And then their market shrinks, and then they cut back some more, and then they do more entertainment stuff. And it's a death dance they're having. And it's a death dance for our society. And I think what's going to happen in the media reform movement in the coming year, in 2007 and 2008, the demand, the campaign to create institutions, structures, and support for viable journalism, well-paid journalists in community after community, in competing newsrooms, covering stories with institutional protection from people in power, community media, small commercial media, is going to become one of the central issues of the media reform movement, if not our defining movement. Because if we know anything, in fact, the name of our group, Free Press, comes from this, it's that our entire constitution is not predicated on the right of people to have a free press. It's predicated on the need of people to have a free press. Hugo Black, the wonderful Supreme Court judge, who's probably done, wrote, written the most beautiful opinions on freedom of the press, and the most definitive ones, has made it clear our whole Constitution rests on having a free press. It's the premise, it's the unstated premise of the whole project. If we don't have an informed citizenry, all, every word in our Constitution is meaningless if you don't know your privileges, your rights, if you aren't aware of what's going on. We have to have a press system. It's our duty, not our right, to build a free press. And the foundation of a free press of doing that is healthy journalism, creating institutions that can do it. And that's the main job, or one of the central jobs of this movement in the coming years. Um. So one of the things that Free Press is going to be asking people to, to do this year is to show up at the local FCC hearing when they come to town. What, what would you say to people to encourage them to do that? <clears throat> if they're like, that sounds boring as, as you know, watching paint dry. Why would I want to do that? What, what, what would you say to those people? I would say that they should get out of, go to the internet if they're near the internet um, or go to the library if they don't have internet access and get a copy of the U.S. Constitution, just Google U.S. Constitution, and look at the First Amendment, and look at what the five freedoms are that are protected in the Constitution. And conspicuous among those five is one that's rarely talked about. It's called the right to assemble peaceably. And there's something extraordinary and magical about getting a lot of people together with common concerns, genuine concerns, seeing each other physically, be in their presence, and then have the privilege to confront people in power to make people in power sit and listen to you talk, not just be lectured by them. And that's what goes on at these hearings. And that's why I think almost without exception, everyone who started with that idea that, boy, how boring, go sit at some wonky thing about media policy, about ownership, about localism. Uh, almost everyone who comes out of the experience feels energized, they feel like they've awoken again, and they feel like they've done something that's been maybe the most important thing they could possibly do with their time. And I think that the point to remember, too, about this is that what, it's not just for the participants, the people of the Federal Communications Commission, to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people across the political spectrum, from every community, uh, every segment of the community, come forth with their stories, their experiences with the media, heartfelt, oftentimes extraordinarily intelligent. Uh, to hear this, uh, it, it really does wonderful things to them. The principled ones, the thoughtful ones, the people like Michael Copps and Jonathan Adelstein are moved by it, they're shaped by it, and they understand as public servants they have an obligation to listen and learn and then to have that inform the work they do. And they go back and what that does is it takes their backbone and it puts wrought iron steel in it. So when they go back to see that phalanx of 3,000 AT&T lobbyists in $10,000 suits driving $100,000 cars, waving their checkbooks and glad handing them and back slapping them and telling them how great they are, promising them the million dollar a year job like these guys usually get when they leave the SEC, they can look in the mirror and they see in that glisten in their eye those 500 people, that single mom who doesn't have any news coverage and they remember who they're working for. That's what it does, and that's why it's crucial people do this. They make history by doing it. Um, my last question for you, Bob. If you were to pick 
make a sort of, you know, Bob McChesney's fantasy wish list for 2007. You have three wishes. Um, what would they be? You mentioned neutrality earlier. I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what would those, what are those three ideal outcomes you'd like to see for 2007? The Celtics winning the NBA title. Okay. Yeah. That, is that not, is that, four? Yeah, I got two left. Am I allowed to, uh, can I wish for more wishes? <laughs> you know, the old scam? <laughs> no, there's a standard, no, you can't wish for more wishes clause. Oh, no, that's no fair. Um, three favorite, well, in terms of media policy, the, the, the ones I would like to see most that are realistic, that aren't fantasy ones like Kevin Martin actually developing a social conscience. Uh, if I wanted realistic uh, goals for, the, certainly to win net neutrality, get it signed into law, make it the law of the land, and take that off the table for all time, keeping the internet free and open. That's absolutely crucial. Secondly, what I'd like to see is the research, the public hearings, and media ownership to lead to truly enlightened legislation to create diverse ownership in this country. Um, and third, what I'd like to see is the discussion about how to preserve journalism, build those institutions, to spawn a healthy, vibrant, local and national journalism competitive crystallized to the point where we're talking about what we can do with community media, public access TV, low power radio, public radio, public TV, uh, and possibly with things like having community owned newspapers and communities where the commercial owners basically have gutted it to the point where it's no longer functional. Having that discussion translate into real policies, real resources that move us toward an environment where we have a viable, healthy uh, journalism again.